It's pretty easy. I was born in Columbus, Ohio in 1944 in a state and a country of apartheid. And I was one of the first black babies actually to be born at the uh, hospital that had opened up. And uh, I was born and had some initial issues with breathing and struggling and needed an incubator and some attention. And they had limited supply. And some people had decided they weren't going to make me one of those persons in one. And my doctor, P.H. Blunt at that time, uh, who was the only black gun uh, uh, licensed to be in the, in the, in the hospital, um, picked me up and put me in one and guarded my life overnight. Wow. And so I, I entered the world with a guardian in that sense and, 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 and an awareness. So my survival was based on someone having the courage to, uh, to buck the system or ensure that the system was equitable. And so I know that story. I grew and I came into a family, the O'Neills and the Hoovers, and um, we were kind of this strange mini uh, U UN. So Thanksgivings and gatherings, family gatherings, we had folks of all kind of heritages, Native American, white, black, and a history. So my family was multiracial, multicultural in a time when that was uh, unusual. And we loved each other and had real connections. So, my vision of a world was that's what the world ought to be like. And so, because that was my family. And so I've kind of tried to live into that dream in the larger world most of these years. Uh, at early stage, my, uh, the, when I was in el going to elementary school, key point, uh, the principal of the school that was a predominantly, that was a black school and had a black faculty, uh, said to my mom, because he was also the choir director at our St. Philip's Episcopal Church, don't send me all to kindergarten. Uh, he says, because I'm working on getting the line changed, because we were on this side of McCoy Street, which went to Garfield, which had basically white uh, teachers and others who were not in relationship uh, always with the community. And so what happened, aha, is that... You saw the light. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so that's what happened. And it was the best thing. I went to Felton uh, during time of segregation. My principal had a PhD, all, uh, at least half, if not all, the teachers had master's degree or advanced education. They believed in us. They believed we should learn. They taught us to take on the world. Uh, we were the highest rated elementary school, including the university school at that time in, in Columbus. And so that was the grounding that said, you can do anything you want. We expect you to do it. Find your path and, and move it. Uh, and I could go on and on, but stories like that shaped my early. Being in St. Philip's Episcopal Church, which was a black church, not a mission. Most uh, churches in Episcopal churches were missions. That they were dependent on the white structure, didn't pay their own way. We were the second highest educated uh, congregation, actually I think we were the first in terms of education, we were the second highest income because there was Procter & Gamble in, 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 in Cincinnati. So I, and I, but my dad was a steel worker. My mom worked, uh, she was a nurse but she didn't practice nursing because she had an eye issue, but she nursed in the community. So, and I say all this because I got shaped by this sense of the world that I was born into was not the way the world had to be. A little McCoy Street, as we called it, was this different kind of world. And, and I could go to this church where the wealthy blacks and others were there. My dad was the treasurer of the church. My mom was the superintendent of the Sunday schools. So the skills said, if you, if you, if you have competence, if you're trustworthy, that you can be anything you want to be. I'm saying all that because that really shaped who I became. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, during that era, I also became a Whitney Young Fellow at that uh, uh, Young Future Leaders of America program, whatever they called it. And so Whitney Young became a role model for me at an early age, uh, and that played into my religious choices later. He happened to be a Unitarian Universalist, which I found out later. And I thought that making change was a direction that made sense. Uh, so I started heading to college about 62, and again, we're beginning to feel that the civil rights movement is having some impact, but it, it was running up against the wall of real change. And so I went into college thinking, what am I going to do? And I thought I'd go to the Air Force because in the service, people of color were beginning to get recognition. But in the midst of that, the Vietnam War was going on, and the summer of 64 happened. And isn't it interesting? This is the 50th anniversary as we're taping this. Summer of 64 was the beginning of a revolution in this country. Most people didn't know what it was going to be or where it would go. And I got caught up in that and all the possibilities of 64 as the civil rights 
legislation came into being in 65 with the voters' rights. And so technically, we're no longer a legal apartheid nation. And so how do we then create this new world and realize I was on the, on the cusp, I was on the cutting edge, I was one of those who had to help shape that world and decided that ministry was one of the places that might do that. Um, and unfortunately, when Dr. King was assassinated in 1968, um, that was a turning point because some of us said we have to t carry forth the vision and the dream because he can't do it, so it's up to us. But I was taught to treat people as people and to look at their hearts. And so, and that's what King tried to say. So that became my path into ministry. I got to seminary and found out, guess what? Racism operates in seminaries too. So some of us, literally, it's called the lockout. We closed the seminary down. We locked it up to start a conversation. And it worked. And over a three, four week period, we actually revisioned the seminary at that time, and of, of the future, as we called it, that really will tr create and model how we can be a community, the microcosm of the beloved community. And so that became my ministry. That shaped my path to ministry. I began to see there was a different kind of ministry than just being a parish minister. To, to work with the community, to do systemic change. Um, and I've been blessed with some of the people I've been in contact with who've given me opportunities and been mentors. Um, and so we began to do that work. And working, bringing the, bringing the church outside of the walls, being in the community, partnering with folks. Uh, taking on systemic issues in education particularly, housing discrimination, uh, creating uh, projects and things like that. And so that's part of that cycle of the 60s and 70s. And, and then something happened. It was called the 80s with Ronald Reagan. And a lot of those strategies of that time were blocked. A lot of the federal assistance and the laws that were being enforced stopped. And so we began to regress and the opportunities for growth and developing an authentic inclusiveness was, was put off track again. Um, and so that's been, then the issue was how do we get out of that? So some of us gathered in the 90s and says, what did we not do right in the civil rights era? What was the learning? Uh, and it was kind of the thing that at the end, Malcolm and Martin, 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 Malcolm X and Martin Luther King had come to see something together. Malcolm came from the hard, can't trust them to, hey, we have to build a world together. And, and Martin had learned that love and, and faith wasn't enough, that the systems were in place and hearts were good, you could change them, but the systems would still go ahead and, and deliver the same old kind of oppressive hierarchy of, of oppression. Uh, and so we created what we called a, a model of transformative change, anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural, building teams of change to go into institutions and work inside institutions, not just fighting from the outside to use the policies, practices of those institutions to change their purposes and to broaden their understandings of who they serve. And the sense is, it, whether you talk about the biblical perspective, Christian biblical perspective, about how we were all created. If we were all created, we all were born in Africa uh, in the same place. We either all brothers and sisters or cousins or something, and we should, we're part of one family. If you want to look at science, on the other hand, if we all had a mother and a father and the same mother and father, then all the children are related. And the thing that still hasn't happened in this country, we don't behave as if we're truly related. And so how do we begin to build love, stand on the side of love? How do we teach people who've been miseducated to find new paths and to break the patterns, both personal patterns and the cultural and structural patterns that we have to reform those institutions? Well, we start where people are. We ask them, how, we're, I mean, the first thing is people are where they are. So we tell stories. And we invite people to tell their stories. We talk about some of the cultural stories. Um, and then sometimes we just lift up history. When, in, in some of our early work, what we would do is we started an occasion, we'd bring people together. And then before we got into what we were doing and why we were there, we kind of introduced ourselves. And we'd have sheets of paper on the wall. And we'd have these eras. And we'd tell people to go, tell what you know about what happened in these eras. A wall of history, we called it. And so people would go put on those walls what they knew about history. And then we'd walk around and we'd talk about why somebody put something else, what up, what, you know, why they put what they put up there. Then we'd talk about what other things were going on. So our lived experience would show gaps or awarenesses. And we then would build our event with the wall of history surrounding us over the next several days. And, so, and then we would add to it as we learned things. So then we, we tried to deal with factual things, and we also invited people to raise challenges, um, to say, 
because they know what they know or they believe what they know. And then we would try and bring in other worldviews and perspectives. We use videos as well to bring in people to raise consciousness for experiences people might not have. So, and that's still, it's not all that different. It's, it's, and then we would then invite people to get to a point where what we know is you can't force somebody to change. I know that. We know that in terms of just change theory. What you can do, uh, what's the old adage? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. It's kind of that philosophy. So we would lead folks to healthy water and invite them to drink of it. But in a way that they had to make a choice. If they, so after we do our trainings and do our experiencing, that you get to the point, and we, we actually do a diagnosis, diagnosis excuse me, of how structured racism was into our everyday sense. And our claim was, name an institution in the United States that was create, not created for the well-being and survival of white culture and benefit and privilege. And when you push up against it, you can't do it, because that's what institutions are set up to do. And so you drive people to the point, they have to say, oh, no matter how much they want to deny it, they'll try and counter stuff, we give them time to do it all out, eventually you get to the point, that's true. So if that's true, and if no change is made, what's going to happen? It's going to keep being that way. But what does that mean in terms of having an authentic democracy and inclusive culture? We did a, a, a chart of progression, which went from, are we all racist like we used to be? No, stage one, to some awareness, to three, where people have a commitment to diversity and stuff on a personal basis, but don't yet understand the need for transforming the structures, to crossing the Red Sea, as we called it, into an area where you would change institutions and structures, and then you have to change the culture so that, in fact, you have a natural generation, a regenerativeness that comes and creates the future and models, this is how we're going to be as a community. The environment, in my belief, is now like the Martians, because it impacts all of us. And if we don't understand that, then we're talking about the extinction of humanity. And one of my statements is very simple. Life does not need homo sapiens to go on. We are expendable. We haven't been here most of, life's, uh, most of the world's history, and it can exist without us. And so we have a point, this is a choice point in our, in our culture, in, in, in time. So if we can't find a way to see each other as viable, as, as entities, as, as, as humanity, eh, we're, we're riding our own death ticket. And we're beginning to see that really happen. We're watching even some of the groups uh, that were based more around race and class are now beginning, and always dealt with environmental injustice in cities, garbage, pollution, that kind of stuff are now beginning to see the Mother Earth, are beginning to see the interdependent web of life, as we call it. And that, in fact, uh, it, it's the old statement, there's no such thing as a hole in your side of the boat. Mm. It's a hole that impacts all of us. As we found out in a local situation, we had a water crisis. The one thing is that water was important to everyone. So we, our mantra ended up becoming water um, unites right. in the sense that the environment are creating a safe and clean and, and secure environment can unite us. To it's unite. time for us to unite and to save ourselves.